uh, Warren, there was other news that crossed the wires just last night uh, in another deal that you're involved in. That would be backing up Occidental and its bid to try and take over Anadarko, which is also engaged in talks with Chevron, who's also got a bid out there. Um, last night, Occidental put out its own statement and uh, said that it's going to be revising its proposal. It's now talking about a deal, still $76 a share offer, but 78 percent cash and 22 percent stock. Um, by increasing that cash portion, it allows what they call significant immediate value, greater closing certainty, enhanced accretion, because with this, they no longer have to ask their shareholders for permission on this. What, what are your thoughts about where the deal stands and what this latest update says? Yeah, I got a call um, last, yesterday after an evening. First time I, I, I talked to Occidental, uh, actually since uh, a week ago yesterday, Sunday, uh, and they, they told me that they were uh, going in this direction, which I like, but I have nothing to do with it. I mean, I, we, we committed $10 billion and it had nothing to do with uh, whether how they frame, frame their offer, how much they offered, or anything else. That, that, uh, all they knew was that they were sure they could get $10 billion from us if they uh, complete the deal with Anadarko. Um, one of the uh, pieces of the letter that Vicki Holub, the president and CEO of Occidental, put out in its letter back to Anadarko surprised me a little bit with just uh, how it still seems like this is a hostile bid. There's not good faith talks that seem to be taking place between them. Based on her letter, she said this, We remain perplexed at your apparent resistance to obtaining far more value for Anadarko shareholders, which has been expressed clearly through our interactions over the last week. It sounds to me like that is still kind of a hostile bid. What... Well, it, it's uh, my understanding, and, and bear in mind, the first thing I heard about this was a week ago Friday <laughs> when Brian Moynihan called and said the people of Occidental don't like to talk to you. And, and I talked to them on Sunday, uh, a week ago yesterday. Uh, uh, my understanding is Anadarko and Occidental had talked uh, much earlier, uh, uh, well before the Chevron bid. And we're talking about a transaction, and then uh, Chevron made an offer, which Anadarko accepted. Uh, but Anadarko was for sale. I mean, they, and and so it it and it had held talks about selling itself to to uh, uh, Occidental. That's this is my understanding. Uh, and uh, uh, so they were talking. Maybe they were talking to more than two parties, for that matter. I, I wouldn't know that, but. They decided to, that that they were willing to sell. I'm sure, subject to price, obviously, and uh, uh, they accepted an offer. And Occidental felt they had a better offer, and and uh, that's apparently where things still stand. But I don't know uh, uh, part, all the details. Part of the the idea behind it had been that well, would Occidental be able to get approval from its shareholders because its stock was under pressure? Uh, some of the shareholders obviously didn't like the deal. By using your cash instead of issuing as much stock as they had anticipated originally, that will keep them from having to go to their shareholders to ask permission for this. And, and as they're saying in their own level letter, that certainly increases the certainty of this deal taking place and, and, and removes some of that uncertainty. Yeah. I would, I would also think uh, that the shareholders, if, if you own Occidental, you're bullish on oil over over the years, and, and you're probably bullish on the Permian Basin because they have such a significant portion of their assets there. So the idea that they will reduce, use less stock and more cash as part of the deal, although they're getting the cash from, from us, but uh, I, I would think net, if, if I'd been a holder of Occidental over time, I probably would like that kind of a deal. I, at Berkshire, I hate to issue stock. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, ge generally speaking, if any company we own uh, is buying something, we like it better when they buy it for cash than they use stock because we like their stock. Uh, so I, I, we'll, we'll see what the reaction is uh, to this. But but uh, I would just imagine it had been an all stock offer uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. I would I would think people would uh, uh, net their shareholders, but the shareholders will be speaking out, but I would think that share, the shareholders would like the, the, the shift. Uh. Andrew's got a question from back in studio, too. Andrew? Sure. Hey, Warren, I, I was just curious whether whether you were surprised that Anadarko hadn't engaged with Occidental on this at this price, and also 
if there was a price at which you would think that Anadarko, sh uh, rather that Occidental shouldn't pay, meaning if, if Chevron were to come back and they're, you know, five times the size of Occidental, they, they could just write a check and this could be over with if they wanted to. But if the price were to go up, I know you get preferred shares ultimately. Is there a price at which you wouldn't look at this favorably? Well, we've committed the $10 billion, uh, 100%. Uh, it, we do not have any uh, control, nor did we want any control, uh, uh, over what uh, Occidental did with our $10 billion in the terms of everything. There's nothing in our deal that provides that they have to come back to us and request permission uh, really to do anything. It's a remarkable deal, but that's the way we do them and, and, uh, in that respect. Uh, and they, uh, so they get our $10 billion if and when they close a the deal uh, with Anadarko and, and, uh, and they don't have to consult us. They certainly don't need our vote. They don't, uh, it was a matter of courtesy I got the call yesterday, but it was not a matter of necessity on their, their part. And that, that's one of the advantages of dealing with Berkshire. I mean, we can do things that other people don't like to do or their lawyers don't like them to do. And this is not a deal that our lawyers would have written. <laughs> is this deal a bet on the Permian Basin and on oil prices, or is this just a bet on, hey, it's great to have an 8% preferred? Well, I'm great to have an 8% preferred if there isn't any oil there. <laughs> no, it's, a bet on, it's a bet on oil prices over the long term more than anything else. It's also a bet on the fact that, that, that uh, uh, the Permian Basin is what it's cracked up to be and all of that sort of thing. But, but oil prices will determine, uh, will determine uh, whether almost any oil stock is a good investment over time, uh, whether it's Exxon or some wildcat driller. I mean, uh, 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 if oil goes way down, you don't solve that by, by hardly anything. And if it goes way up, you make, uh, you make a lot of money. And, uh, uh, and it, it's not what it does next, next week or next month or next year. You're buying reserves that go far out into the future. So you, you have to have a view on oil over time. And, and uh, Charlie and I have got some views on that, not too specific because they're not that well informed, but that they are. Uh, we, we feel good about, about, about doing the financing. Why don't you just buy it yourself? It's only a $35 billion deal, and you've got $110 billion in cash sitting around. Well, that might have happened if Anadarko had come to us, but, but we, we wouldn't jump into some other deal that we just heard about through somebody coming to us and seeking financing. Uh, we wouldn't, uh, no, we, we, hope that we, we hope people come to us <laughs> on businesses, but uh, I had no idea that this transaction was going to happen. I mean, a week ago Friday when I got the call from Brian Moynihan, uh, well, I'd read in the paper uh, about the deal, but I'd had, I've never had any contact with Anadarko of any sort. Uh, David Faber reported last week that you had said you would offer up to $20 billion, double the $10 billion that you did do on this deal. Is that the case? If they needed it. Uh, but I think they, I mean, they have a, a arrangement obviously with the Bank of America, who called us. I don't know anything about that deal. I just know that, 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 that the B of A has, has arranged that debt financing. Uh, uh, if there were a different sort of thing. But what, I'm, what I meant to some extent with that is I'd be also very happy if somebody calls tomorrow and needs $20 billion. It's Occidental just needed the $10 billion. Okay. But, but you like doing these deals at bigger sizes, not smaller sizes? Uh, exactly. Point? Okay. Um, back to Andrew's point, this is there for forever. It doesn't matter if the bids go up. doesn't matter what happens along the way. Your $10 billion is, is in this deal for whatever is, happens. Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, the, the lawyers don't write deals like this, but we tell them to. Uh, the, uh, there's no material adverse change. There's no, if the stock market closes, but this deal closes, uh, we're there. We're there under all. All circumstances, and uh, uh, we don't, we have not written any outs into it, and uh, uh, but that's part of the traction of doing business with Berkshire, and 
And besides that, we do it all ourselves, so it isn't something that's parceled out among 10 parties and each one comes in and has to get their permission to make changes and all that. Uh, when they came to my office at 10 o'clock on, on Sunday, week ago Sunday, yeah. uh, uh, they knew that if we agreed, uh, which we did by 11 o'clock, they knew Berkshire was 100%. In. Now, they had their own board of directors meeting the following evening. Uh, uh, but they, they could say to their board, you're going to get $10 billion from Berkshire uh, when this closes and you don't need to give a thought to it.